everybody, Wannabe Reviewer here, and welcome back to the Wannabe Podcast, episode 56. Now, before we begin this week's podcast, I just want to talk about this thing that's happening on YouTube that, unfortunately, it is still ongoing, and no one is really sure of how it's going to affect content creators yet, because the wording of it is just so vague, and it's so unclear what exactly this new law or these like features mean or whatever but uh of course you know i don't know how many of you know what i'm talking about but i just briefly wanted to touch upon copa and basically from what i understand based on the research i did which is i kind of just want to share with you guys basically copa is this law that went into place in 1998 and i forget what it's supposed to stand for it's some sort of an acronym but it's supposed to protect children when they're online so that companies don't like store their information and don't like use it to like run ads against kids you know something like that basically you know even though they do it on adults where they you know gather your information and they try to you know personalize ads towards you that sort of thing basically if someone is under the age of 13 websites are not supposed to do this and i guess what happened is that youtube from you know like the law like i said i think the law came on 1998 up until i I believe like 2018 youtube was knowingly breaking this law and they were purposely you know collecting data of children running ads towards kids, you know, making all this money and stuff. And the Federal Trade Commission finally cracked down on YouTube, made them pay a fine. And I guess part of them getting cracked down on is that YouTube now has to regulate uh, their, their content so that kids won't be getting taken advantage of, I guess. Unfortunately, YouTube has chosen to throw content creators under the bus. And instead of really cracking down on only letting people of a certain age make an account, or instead of separating kids onto like their own kids YouTube or whatever, YouTube has decided that content creators have to like self-regulate. And YouTubers have to basically say whether their content is made for kids or is not made for kids. And either way, this really sucks because if you say your content is not made for kids, then as you know, it is very easy to get demonetized. However, on the other side of the thing, if you say that your content is made for kids, you're basically going to be also screwed because if you say that your content is made for kids, then that means that those videos will no longer run ads. They will no longer enable comments and they just won't really be a part of the algorithm, which means that only people who know about your video can really find it. You know, like it won't go into the suggested video section it won't be a part of the algorithm if you search it up, that sort of thing. So that means that either way, you're pretty screwed. And worse than that, of course, is that you say, okay, you know, fine. What do I have to worry about? I don't make kids content. I make mature content. Yeah, it sucks to be demonetized, but maybe I'll get lucky. I can use Patreon, that sort of thing, right? However, from what is understood, the bad thing is that even if your content isn't exactly child friendly, as long as it looks like it is and someone can confuse it as being stuff for kids, that's enough to screw you over. And if you don't label yourself as child friendly, uh, I believe starting, I think like December 10th or something like that, then you can potentially get fined for each video. And it's like a lot of money. It's like, I don't remember how much, but it's like a ridiculous amount. And what makes this thing so hard, and the reason like, I, I'm just kind of touching briefly upon it, I'm not going to go too in detail because I don't know every single detail and it is still very vague and people are still very confused. But what seems that makes this suck is that let's say me. I do anime reviews. Obviously, the anime I covered, they're not for kids, right? Most of them are, you know, for teens or for adults, that sort of thing. Well, it seems that according to this new law, it doesn't matter. Because if I'm reviewing anime, anime is animation. And under this new thing, animation is is for kids because kids like animation. So I'm screwed. Likewise, you know, let's say I do an unboxing and I want to show you guys some new figure that I just got. Well, even though the figure I'm looking at cost a bunch of money and it's something clearly aimed at adults, you know, it's a collector's item. Well, it doesn't matter because figurines are toys and toys are for kids. So that means I'm screwed. So that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm not going to get too into it because no one is sure quite yet what the deal is but unfortunately from what we have looked at you know if you do your research 
it looks like it doesn't even matter if your content is for kids, as long as you're covering stuff that kids would like, like animations, video games, toys, that sort of thing, you will potentially either get fined if you don't label it as for kids, and if you do label it as for kids, your video is basically dead on arrival. So I guess the reason I'm really talking about all this, like I said, even though it's still in the process of happening and this hasn't really gone into effect yet and no one's really sure what's going to happen because it's so vague, I just want to talk about it because it's a scary time for content creators. A lot of content creators don't know what they're going to do because it looks like it might be the end of their channel as we know it. If YouTube really were doing this to protect kids, that'd be great. But because it's so vague and knowing the track record that YouTube has, where they don't exactly always have their creators, you know, best at mind or whatever, then that's why this is important. And this is why it's important to like, you know, stand behind creators. So I guess what I want to say, you know, long story short, I want to talk about this because number one, content creators are freaking out. No one is really sure what's going to happen with this and a lot of people are scared they're going to like lose their their videos and stuff so that's why i think that's important for anyone who doesn't make youtube videos to know about this and number two i just think that it's important to stand by content creators just because you've heard differently and just because you know people you follow it looks like they don't do like child-friendly content it might not matter you know, it's so vague that it might not matter. And so if you see someone freaking out or if you see someone who's unsure of stuff, instead of just like, you know, being a jerk to them and be like, oh, you're over exaggerating, whatever, you know, stand by them because, you know, they're freaking out and no one really knows what's going to happen yet. So, yeah. So this whole Copa thing sucks. No one knows what's going to happen with it. Honestly, I think it's the kind of thing where it's not until a few people get screwed over and they fight it. I think that's where we're going to really see what the extent of this is. And we'll see if like the FTC, you know, like loosens their grip because it sounds like they're like really pushing into this. So it's unfortunate. And I hope that, you know, people don't lose their channels, me included, but I guess we'll have to see where this goes, you know? So I don't know, just stuff is happening on YouTube. I just want you guys to be aware of it. And yeah, I mean, if we all have to jump over to another platform, don't be surprised, you know, because definitely it sucks. This whole Copa thing sucks and people are worried. So there you go. Uh, with that out of the way, of course, you know, like I said, I just want to touch upon that briefly, but with that out of the way, you know, getting back to our regular content or whatever, I had quite a week. I had a big week, honestly. I watched a bunch of anime that I've been talking about in the past. I watched a new anime, which I'll talk about in a second. I checked out Disney Plus, which has a bunch of content. And I played some games, you know? So I've definitely had a very busy week. So yeah, I just want to share that with you guys. And hopefully something that I talk about interests you guys. Uh, starting at the top, of course, starting with anime as usual, I checked out a series called Case File Number 22 one Kabu Kicho. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Kabu Kicho. And basically I had heard about this anime, you know, a few weeks ago. People had described it as like a very campy like interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. And so I watched like the first, I want to say five or six episodes and sure enough, it's fine. I'm not going to say it's anything revolutionary. I'm not going to say it's anything great. But yeah, it's just this very interesting anime series where we have this guy who's supposed to be, you know, Sherlock Holmes, basically. We have our main character who's basically supposed to be John Watson. And Watson, he needs Sherlock to solve a case for him. So he kind of tries to get close to him, becomes his assistant, that sort of thing. And as he's trying to kind of convince Sherlock to take on his case... He follows Sherlock around and Sherlock is this eccentric Japanese detective that he works against this other like there's like these other like five, six detectives that they all meet at this like certain bar and basically they get assignments of different like crimes that have happened and they all compete to see who can solve the crime. And so it's a very campy interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. A lot of, you know, your typical Japanese tropes and stuff. And Sherlock is just kind of a weird guy where he eats really weird food all the time. Whenever he solves a case, he gets really excited. And he tries to explain his thought process using uh, a Rakugo performance, which is basically a little performance where uh, a performer sits uh, cross-legged and using only like a fan as their prop. They try to like, like, 
like explain like a story and tell jokes and stuff. And so it's 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 fine enough. It's interesting enough. I mean, it is very quirky, very weird. Uh, the crimes. It is interesting to see Sherlock's thought process. It is interesting to see like this interpretation of Sherlock and Watson. You know, because like I said, it's just it takes place in Japan basically. And interestingly enough. There's a character called James Moriarty that if anyone knows, that's actually Sherlock's arch nemesis. But here, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's going to play a part into the series later. He's this teenager that he kind of like hangs out with Sherlock and he kind of idolizes him. So like, that's really interesting. And so I don't know. I mean, like the anime is fine. I'm definitely not going to call it like a headliner. I'm not going to say it's one that's blown me away. Similar to, you know, other anime I've talked about recently, like you know, like Vinland Saga or Beast Stars or anything like that. But if you're just looking for like a fun, quirky, campy interpretation of Sherlock or just like a mystery sort of thing taking place in Japan or whatever. I mean, it's a fun, it's a fun watch. It's interestingly enough, you know, uh, over on my anime list, it has a rating of, I think last time I checked, it was like 6.6. And that's like on a scale of 10. So that kind of shows you that somewhere in the middle, you know, it's not great. And I definitely think that the grade it has, I, I would agree with, you know. But uh, once again, that is case file number 221, Kabu Kicho. It's like a weird anime interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. Like I said, it's very campy. It sees him dealing with like a case of the week and competing against other, you know, eccentric uh, detectives. So if that interests you, check it out. Like I said, I kind of recommend it. I don't think it's the best, but I don't, I don't think it's the worst. I think it's just like a fun show to watch. I don't know, maybe before you watch one of the big headliners or right after to kind of like cool down. So, you know, there you go. Alrighty, moving on. As I said, I checked out Disney Plus this last week. Basically, uh, I signed up for the free seven day uh, trial or whatever. And uh, I'm not really sure yet if I want to buy a service because it does have some good stuff, but I'm not really sure if I'm willing to pay at the moment. But basically, Disney Plus checked it out and... It does have a lot of content, honestly. Like it has a pretty, had a pretty good launch date. It basically has every Pixar movie, every Pixar like short, you know, that comes out before the Pixar movies. It has every Disney animated movie. It has a bunch of Disney like sports films, a bunch of Disney like old school films. It has every Star Wars film. I believe every Marvel film, a few original stuff, you know, a few original series, a few series back from like Disney, uh, the Disney Channel has them on here too. Uh, a lot of animated cartoons from back in the day, you know, like a lot of those uh, Saturday afternoon ones or whatever has a bunch of like those animated Disney shows and it has a bunch of like National Geographic stuff. So it definitely has a pretty big library, you know, even though it just started. Uh, other stuff that it has on there, the only thing I could really see that has to do with Fox that I really had on there, it has the Avatar movie, and it has every season of The Simpsons, which I think that's pretty cool. Uh, that aside though, something that I watched that I want to talk about is that it had a Lady in the Tramp live action film, and... Uh, it's crazy because I went in expecting it to be really bad. I thought it was going to be like on the level of like the Lion King, you know, where I just thought it was like really emotionless and really soulless and stuff. And I thought they were going to make like a bunch of changes that were probably going like, to ruin the film. But not going to lie, Lady and the Tramp, the live action version on Disney Plus, it was actually pretty good. You know, like I think they did a really good job with it. Like, when compared to, like, The Lion King, like I said, The Lion King, they made all sorts of unnecessary changes that kind of just leave you scratching your head. Like, in The Lion King, the new one, for whatever reason, Scar doesn't sing a villain song. Instead, it's spoken word. You know, it's like a speech, which is, like, really weird. And I don't know, just, like... Like, just stuff here and there that they changed that I didn't really enjoy. I just thought it was really random, right? Um, Here, even though they made some changes, I wouldn't say that any of them were, like, that big of a deal. Or if they changed some stuff, I feel like it worked better, honestly. Like, one thing that they changed, for instance, um, in the original Lady and the Tramp, I think it's just supposed to take place somewhere in, like, the Midwestern United States, you know? It's just, like, a whatever little town doesn't really matter it's just like any other town uh here they changed the location to new orleans 
And yeah, even though it's like a weird change, I think it works. I think it makes the setting just much more interesting because instead of just plain looking houses, you have New Orleans with, you know, it's interesting houses. And I don't know. I just think it's an interesting change. It's it's, it's fine. Uh, likewise, one of the dogs that's a uh, lady's friend in the original, both of the dogs she really hangs out with. One's like a little like Scottish terrier and the other one's like a bloodhound. Uh, they're both guys. Here they changed one of her friends into a girl, the little Scottish terrier. They made it a little girl and it's not that big of a deal. You know, I think it's fine. Kind of a weird change, but it works. You know, I, I like hearing the little Scottish little dog running around and hearing her little accent and stuff was funny and seeing how her owner is an artist that's always drawing her as like the Mona Lisa and stuff like that. I thought that was funny, you know? So like that was a change that I was like, eh, that's fine. Not a big deal. Uh, when it comes to like emotions and expressions and stuff, I was really worried that they were going to make it, like I said, really soulless and it was going to be like the Lion King when, you know, you can't see any emotion on their face. Like when they're supposed to be sad or whatever, like you can't even tell. And when they're singing and they're supposed to be like enjoying themselves, like the choreography is really bad. But here they actually managed to do a good job where the dogs show emotions, you know, uh, like near the beginning, there's a part where Lady first gets her collar and she wants to show her friends. And like, I swear, as you're looking at the little dog sitting there, she looks excited. Like her face is kind of perked up the way she's like wagging her tail and stuff. Like she looks like she's excited and she can't wait to tell her friends about her collar. Uh, likewise, during the famous, you know, scene where uh, uh, Tramp and Lady, they're having like their meatball dinner or whatever. I swear they made the dogs look bashful. Like you look at them and they kind of look bashful. They look embarrassed, you know, like the choreography and like the expression is there where, you know, it doesn't have to be anything like too over the top, but they make the dogs look away and they kind of make their eyes a certain way and like. I don't know. I mean, like the, the, the non-verbals are there. So I don't know. I guess I'm kind of ranting a little bit, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that Lady and the Tramp, you know, the live action version, is it perfect? No. Once again, I think it's one of those things where if you have the original animated version, go watch that because I do think it's like the best. You know, I do think it's like, like the better movie, but if you're going to check this one out, I'd suggest it because I do think it's a good interpretation. Like I said, you know, the changes aren't too bad or there's some things where I think it makes the movie a bit more interesting. Uh, the emotion is there. You know, they do have expressions on the dog's faces. They do have great, you know, choreography or whatever, where it, it feels like it adds to the movie. It makes them feel human. You know, like that you can tell they're going through emotions and like that sort of thing. And the movie looks good. I think the way the dogs look is really good, you know. Uh, I think the music was really good when the guys are singing for like the uh, candlelit dinner. I think it's really nice how they have like a new version of the song and then it kind of melds with the original chorus from like the original movie. Like I thought that was really creative the way they did that. So, you know, like good music, good voice acting, good visuals, changes that aren't terrible, you know, they're fine. And with they actually managed to give these animals expressions and emotions and stuff. So I like the movie. It definitely was more than I expected because I expected it to be terrible. And yeah, I'm just going to say that I'm surprised this is the one that didn't get the theatrical release. Like the fact that the Lion King got the theatrical release when it's like so crappy and just so blah and this one didn't. I think that's a big disappointment, you know? I think it's sad that they didn't have faith in it, but it is what it is. Point is, if you can watch the movie, I'd say check it out. I thought it was, I thought it was fun. You know, I thought it was a good interpretation. So there you go. Alrighty, moving on. I played two video games this week and one of them, I'm just going to talk about it briefly because I talked about it last week. Uh, I continue to play more Death Stranding and I put a review of it out earlier this week. You guys can go check that out. It kind of helps explain the game more, kind of shows more of the in-game footage, that sort of thing. And all I can really say is that, yeah, I like this game. I know it's not for everybody. I know that people are really mixed on it. Some people kept calling it a walking simulator. Some people just said that the story, they feel it's too all over the place, that sort of thing. But personally, I liked it, you know? I think that delivering packages and having to walk from point A to point B 
I enjoyed it, you know? I think people over-exaggerate when they call it a walking simulator. I mean, a walking simulator to me is like the Stanley Parable, where you literally just walk and click on things and that's it. Here, there is gameplay that I think people sell the game short on, you know? Like there's structures to build, there's paths to plan, there's creatures and fellow humans to fight, there's vehicles you can ride on, there's all sorts of things you can do, you know? Like there's a lot you can do. So I enjoyed the gameplay. I thought it was fun. And as for the story, maybe I'm just used to and I just have like a tolerance for bullshit because I watch so much anime and so much, you know, like foreign films that kind of like to lean into the like the absurd and stuff. But I like the story. I think the story, weird as it is, I find it interesting. Yes, it can get a little bit eye rolly at times. Some of the dialogue is kind of cringy. But that doesn't take away from the fact that I think Hideo Kojima was just going for something really different and really unique and really weird, you know? And I just enjoy it, you know? I just had a good time with it. So is it for everybody? No. But I do think you should check out as much gameplay as possible if you're interested in the game because, I don't know, I mean, I just feel like there's a lot there. And I think the more informed you can get about the game and if you can, like, try it out, like, if you know someone who can, like, let you, you know, get hands-on experience, I think that's important because I think the game is, you know, a good game. I just think people maybe just need to give it a chance, you know? So, there you go. Uh, of course, the other game that I played this week, I had been excited for this game for a long time, you know, despite all the criticism and stuff. And I am, of course, talking about Pokemon Sword. Uh, you know, there was the Sword and Shield version. I decided to go with the Sword version. And I currently... I'm a little past the first gym because mostly I was just taking my time to grind up and like catch a lot of Pokemon, you know, in the wild area. But uh, so far, I'm really enjoying the game. I think that the starters, even though I love Score Bunny, like that was my number one choice. I've never considered getting any of the other Pokemon. I think the starters are fine. I think they're each cute in their own way. Uh, Score Bunny, you know, personally, I don't like its third evolution. I don't even know if I'm going to ever evolve it to its third evolution. I currently gave my uh, Score Bunny, uh, now a Raboot, I gave it an Everstone because I don't want it to evolve. But I like Score Bunny. I think it's, uh, I think its design is cute. I think Raboot, I think that's also very cute. It looks like a little, like, emo ninja that, like, always walks around with its hands in its pocket. I think that's really fun. So when it comes to starters, I love them. When it comes to the story, I really enjoy it because I do think it is different enough from other games. Uh, other games, you know, you want you go from like the you go to around traveling around, you challenge the eight gyms, you go to like the victory road, and then you challenge the championship and elite four, blah blah blah. I feel like it's always the same thing, right? With like a few differences. Here, I appreciate that they threw in this whole like tournament aspect because I always did find it weird that in other games, even though Pokemon is basically like the economy of the, the universe, I do find it weird how you always challenge the gyms and no one's there to watch. I've always thought that's weird, you know, it just happens in secret. So I think it's cool how here you travel from town to town and certain towns have like these gyms. And I think it's really fun how, at least when it comes to like the first gym, you do some sort of like a little challenge. You know, like the first one, it's you have to like herd uh, Wooloos, or it's like little, little sheep Pokemon. Uh, you have to herd them. And then once you complete the challenge, then you fight the, the gym leader. And you fight the gym leader in this huge arena where there's all these fans watching and cheering for you. So I think that's really interesting. You know, I think that's kind of cool what they threw in this tournament aspect where, you know, you need to get endorsed by, you know, someone just to even compete, and then you compete, and, you know, you go from tournament to like, tournament, you're working your way up, and there's, like, a lot of fans, you're getting fame along the way. I think that's really fun. Um, so I like, I like the story aspect. Uh, when it comes to the rivals, a lot of people have complained that they think it sucks how in recent games, you only have, like, the very friendly rival who's, like, your best friend, and he's very energetic, and he's running around helping you or whatever. Um, well, the game does have that, you know, because Hop, he's like your childhood best friend and he's definitely all of those things. You know, he's like this energetic kid always like trying to help you or whatever. I think what's cool is that Hop isn't your only rival. You actually have three rivals in this game. One of them is Hop, who's like the happy-go-lucky, always pointing everything out, always trying to help you, you know, kind of rival. Uh, then you have this girl that she basically is kind of like, she has like a goth look. 
And she is kind of like a lone wolf, you know, she kind of keeps to herself. But she's kind of cool because she is friendly enough when you talk to her. And she does apologize for Team Yell. Team Yell is always causing you trouble and she kind of apologizes for them. So she's just kind of in the middle, you know. Her her team causes you trouble and she is kind of like a lone wolf that kind of keeps to herself. She has like a very dark look. But at the same time, she is friendly, you know. And she does stop to chat and you know that sort of thing. So she's kind of in the middle. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have BD. And BD is just like a total jerk like one of the first lines he tells you when you talk to him he basically says that he got his endorsement from the chairman of like uh the tournament or whatever and he says that basically he's like more important than everybody present and he says how dare you waste his time he's too important to talk to you and like every time you run into him he's just like a huge jerk always causing trouble or whatever and putting you down. So there you go, you know? I like that you have three different types of rivals. You have one that's a total jerk. You have one that's like totally your friend. And he's always energetic, trying to help you out. And you have the girl. I think her name's Marnie, maybe. I think it might be Marnie. But yeah, you have her that she's right in the middle. She's kind of a lone wolf. She has kind of a dark look to her. But, you know, she's friendly enough, you know, if she runs into you. So I think that's really cool. Uh, finally, not only do I like, like, the game, not only do I like the, uh, starters and the story and, like, the rivals and stuff, but I just think that a lot of stuff that the game adds is really cool. Like, does it suck that they took out some of the Pokemon? Yes. Does it suck that they use a lot of the same animations or whatever? Yes. Does it suck that they took out stuff like, you know, Mega Evolutions and, you know, stuff like that that they introduced and Hard Mode and, like, that sort of thing? Yeah, it does kind of suck. But on the other hand, though, they did add a lot of stuff that I'm a fan of. I think the wild area is great. I think it's great how you literally just go to this huge area and you can keep coming back as you level up and you can challenge and like fight and find a bunch more Pokemon. I think that's great. I think that the camping is great. I think that, you know, you can camp and you can like play with your Pokemon. That helps them level up and get more friendly towards you. I think that's fun. I think that the uh, cooking curry is fun. Basically, you know, you use all sorts of ingredients you find in the world and you make food. And I think it's fun just coming up with new recipes, seeing what different curry gets made. Uh, I think it's cool that each time you make curry, it gives your Pokemon experience and like friendliness and like that sort of thing. I think that's a cool feature. And uh, a lot of people were like um, complaining about the experience share. I thought the experience share is fine. I used to honestly be very annoyed how in old games you would have to like go through and grind and grind and grind and you'd have to like switch out Pokemon even if they weren't going to do anything just so they can get experience so they can like level up and stuff. I honestly thought that was super boring. You know, I thought having to like, you know, trade Pokemon in and out and blah, 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 just for them to get, you know, experience. I thought that sucked. So I think the fact that everybody gets experience from a match now, I think that's awesome. And I do think that helps keep your party a bit more balanced, you know? So I really like that. And I don't know. I mean, I guess that's really it for now. I'm not like that far into the game, you know? But like I said, from what I've seen, I like the starters. I like the world. I like the story. I like a bunch of the features they added in, and I like, you know, that they changed everything to, like, a tournament aspect. I think it makes it interesting. Uh, I think the game's fun. I've had a blast with it so far. I'm excited to play more of it, and... I don't know, from what I've seen online, I think a lot of people are also enjoying it. I think it's the kind of thing where like, yes, the game has issues. Yes, it sucks that Nintendo or Game Freak or whatever didn't do a better job of like innovating and like making it like more different. But that doesn't mean the game's bad, you know? I think the game's fun. I've had a blast with it. I think they've added a lot of stuff that makes it fun, makes it worth your time. And like I said, I just look forward to playing more. So there you go. Alrighty guys, and that basically does it for my week. I feel like it was a pretty full week. I guess in like retrospective as I'm talking about it, it doesn't sound as big, but you know, all the same. Hopefully you guys enjoyed me talking about the new anime that I watched, or the Lady and the Tramp movie, you know, I gave an opinion on that. Or, you know, one of the two games that I played. Hopefully you guys enjoyed info and you know insight into those two games so there you go uh hopefully next week i know that i got my copy of shenmue 3 i'm gonna try to pop that in so i can talk about it uh i definitely have more stuff to watch on disney plus before my free trial is up so hopefully i cover one of those things and as always there's just more anime to watch i think there's a few 
like at least one or two more anime that I had heard might be worth checking out. So hopefully I'll share those with you guys, you know, next week. But until then, that was my week. Hopefully you guys had fun with it. You know, there you go. Uh, Moving on to the news, of course. This first news story, I'm not going to read the whole thing because, you know, it goes pretty in depth. I think it's the kind of thing that you guys should read for yourselves. But as the title of the article states, the Game Awards 2019 nominees announced. So I think that's pretty fun. Uh, Game Awards, I think this year it is going to be, let's see, I know it's always in December. This year, the Game Awards 2019 will be December 12th. Now, I know people can be pretty awkward when it comes to award shows because I know people always feel like it's just kind of an excuse for people to pat themselves on the back. They always feel kind of iffy about how some games get mentioned, some don't, that sort of thing. And I I do agree with that, you know. I think that definitely uh, an award show is something you shouldn't take too seriously, you know, because of like some of those reasons, like some things get left out and it does seem like a big excuse for everybody to just pat themselves on the back or whatever. But at the same time, though, I do think the Game Awards show is really fun, you know? Like, they always have, like, really cool musical performances. They always release a bunch of, like, really cool trailers. I think that even if some games do get left out, I think, you know, the fact that there are certain games that do get recognition and they do get, you know, like, some recognition and people are, like, honoring them and stuff, I think it's the kind of thing where I try to be positive, Instead of focusing on what got left out or trying to be cynical, I just like to look at what's getting, you know, nominated. And I like to, you know, if it's a game I like, I try to root for it, you know? Because I think that's the kind of thing I like to do. Instead of being negative and being like, oh, this game got left out or that game got left out or this is all for ad space, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just try to have fun with it and I just try to, you know, if there's a game I like, I root for it. And I, I just try to take it, you know, in stride or whatever. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but some stuff that I thought was interesting, for instance, uh, for best family game, I think it's funny how every single game nominated is a Nintendo game. Uh, for best family game, it's Luigi's Mansion 3, Ring Fit Adventure, Super Mario Maker 2, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, or Yoshi's Crafted World. So, I don't know. I just think that's really funny that, you know, all the games are Nintendo games. So, a lot of people were laughing at that, and I do agree. Um, Another thing that I thought was really interesting is that for best independent game, they have Baba Is You, Disco Elysium, Katana Zero, The Outer Wilds, and Untitled Goose Game. And I have played a couple of these, and I think that's a really good list. I think the fact that Untitled Goose Game is there and like Baba Is You is there. I mean, those are like two really creative games, you know, that I enjoyed both of them. So I think that's really fun to see them on there, you know, so I I just want to share that real quick. And like I said, I won't read all of them. You guys can read through them. But of course, the biggest one is Game of the Year. And the run, you know, the nominees are Control, Death Stranding, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Resident Evil 2, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, and The Outer Worlds. And yeah, I mean, that's definitely a really good list, you know? Uh, I've played quite a few of these. Even the ones I haven't played, such as like The Outer Worlds, I've heard they're really good. And like I said, I mean, this is where people get salty and they start mentioning the game that they liked and how it's a ripoff that it's not on the list, it's not nominated, that sort of thing. But I don't know, I like to stay positive about it. Instead of looking at what's not on the list, I just look at what is on the list and I'm just happy for those games because I think each of those games is definitely a good game. You know, they're each creative in their own way. They're each really fun in their own way. And I guess the one that surprises me the most is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Because compared to all these other games, I feel like all these games are kind of more mature, they're more deep, they're more, I don't know, they're like more, like just mature, you know, they're more like, like, a lot of these are like, I think every single one of these is like a PS4 title. And you have Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, little Nintendo game over here on the Switch, and just the fact that it's getting representation, I think that's really cool, you know? Like, I think it's crazy how Super Smash Bros. Ultimate has really found a way to like be relevant and to like make it big. So I just think that's really cool. So I don't know. I, I just want to share this. I think the Game Awards show's fun. I'm definitely going to tune in December 12th to watch it. And yeah, just let me know what you think. Let me know if you agree with these lists. Tell me stuff that you're looking forward to. Likewise, what kind of 
trailers or announcements are you expecting to see at the Game Awards show? Let me know in the comments section below. Let's move on. Moving on, this next one is a short one, but I just wanted to share it because, as you know, I've been sharing news about the Google Stadia, and Google Stadia, ever since I heard about it, it sounds like a huge mess, and sure enough, it uh, came out, it launched on the 19th, and it seems like it's basically down arrival, it seems like there's a lot of issues with it, and that's why this second news story, if you want to call it that, uh, as the title says, Gene Park's one GIF review of Stadia. And basically there's this guy, his name is Gene Park. He does reviews for the Washington Post and he, he did, his review is basically just this GIF. That if you open it up, it's on Twitter and it says, here's my Google Stadia review in one GIF. This is on the Washington Post Gigabyte Ethernet last week. And basically what our guy does, he hits the space bar, turns to look at the camera, points at his computer, and then his character jumps. So that basically tells you everything you know about, you need to know about Google Stadia, even though they're charging 140 bucks, to then have the privilege to be able to stream games that you buy, there is a lot of gap. Uh, there is a lot of lag. Like even if you have gigabytes worth of Ethernet, there is still issues. And no one's surprised. Everyone saw this coming. I mean, and that the sad part is, not only does everybody see this coming, but think about it. If this is how laggy it is on an Ethernet gigabyte connection. Just imagine someone out like in the boonies trying to use it. Someone who gets like megabytes per second. Like, yeah, I, no one, I don't know who Google Stadia is for. Google Stadia is just so not thought out, you know? And so yeah, just wanna share that real quick. I think it's worth a look. Uh, obviously if you look farther down, the guy does explain his uh, experience, you know, like using it at home, uh, using it on a phone, that sort of thing. But basically, yeah, if you look into it, Google Stadia is not doing great. And I'm just wondering how long before they ditch it, you know? Because Google is pretty infamous for just if a project looks like it's not working out or it's not gangbusters, they'll basically just retire it or like kill it really soon. So I'm just wondering how long before they kill off Google Stadia, you know, like I am very curious. So I suggest looking up the GIF. It's really funny to look at. And the guy's review, you know, it's like a, a thread of tweets for his review. It is really insightful. So there you go. Alrighty, moving on to movie news. This one is just a funny one. I just want to share it because just it is just so over the top. But I swear it sounds perfect for this guy. I mean, you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. But as the title of the article states, Nicolas Cage will play, ellipses, Nicolas Cage in new movie. And sure enough, it says Nicolas Cage, you know, if you read the article, Nicolas Cage will star as Nicolas Cage in a film titled The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. And sure enough, if you read it, it sounds like a total acid trip. Basically, it's a movie about Nicolas Cage playing himself and in it. So if you read the article, you know, farther down it says, Unbearable Weight will follow Cage, who has reached rock bottom. Feverly trying to land a role in the latest Quentin Tarantino film, reconnect with his teenage daughter, and also overcome horrendous debt, in the film Cage will have internal conversations with a 90s movie star version of himself. Cage agrees to meet with the billionaire from Mexico who wants to cast him in a project, but chaos ensues when he learns the billionaire is a drug kingpin and is then recruited by the CIA to bring the dealer down. Dude, I don't know about you, but that sounds like the most ridiculous movie ever. It sounds like the most over-the-top movie ever. And then, therefore, I think Nicolas Cage is perfect for the role. So it's going to be about a movie, Nicolas Cage playing himself, trying to get himself relevant again, trying to reconnect with his teenage daughter. He has a shoulder, devil, angel, whatever you want to call it. That's a 90s movie star version of himself. And yeah, apparently he's going to get caught up with Kingpins and with... uh the CIA. So I think that sounds like one hell of a movie. I think it sounds ridiculous. I'm excited to check this out because it just sounds so crazy. And I feel only somebody like Nicolas Cage can pull it off. 
So I'm looking forward to this. I think it sounds interesting. I think it sounds ridiculous and I really want to see how this goes. I don't know if any of you guys have similar love for Nicolas Cage. I mean, the man is basically a caricature of himself. I think he's awesome. But if you're excited for it, keep an eye out for it. There you go. All right, not too much movie news for this week. I mean, that was it for movie news. Uh, moving on to TV news. This is a very strange one. Not really sure what to think about it. I mean, it makes sense in a way, but it's just, it's still weird. Uh, as the title of the article states, Fast and Furious animated spinoff, first look images revealed as cast is confirmed. So basically, I didn't know this. But apparently the Fast and the Furious, they've been working for some time on making an animated spinoff. And basically it's called Fast and Furious Spy Racers. And it's going to be a Netflix exclusive. It says that Vin Diesel will be an executive producer. And it's weird. Basically, it's going to follow... Uh, it says right here, the plot of the show will follow Tony Toretto, teen cousin of franchise lead Dom Toretto, as he and his friends are recruited by the government to infiltrate an international racing league run by an evil crime syndicate named, it, it's Shifter, but it's using numbers and stuff letters. It's, it's, it's dumb. Uh, who is bent on ruling the world? So it's weird. So we're getting a Fast and the Furious spinoff that's supposed to be more like aimed at a younger audience. And it's all about a teenage cousin of Vin Diesel's character and they're spies and they're racing around. So that's the thing. On the one hand, this sounds really dumb and it sounds like an obvious cash grab. On the other hand, though, the Fast and the Furious is so ridiculous. Like, I mean, like, seriously, the, the series has become so ridiculous that at the same time when you read, there's going to be an animated series about these kids being spies or whatever. It kind of sounds par for the course. And it actually sounds like it makes sense, honestly. And I don't know. I mean, the fact that it's animated, it feels like it's actually less ridiculous than like the movie series, because I feel like you can get a lot, you can get away with a lot more in animation. So as weird as this project sounds, and as much as like a cash grab as it sounds, it being an animated series makes sense in a weird way. So like, that's really weird. And I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where, I mean, Fast and the Furious, a lot of people are kind of mad about how dumb it's gotten. But I've kind of swung the other way around where I just want to see how dumb it can get, honestly. Like, I really hope that we get to a, 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 pay, a place in time where the Fast and the Furious movies are about, like, time travel and fighting in space. And I don't know. I mean, the more ridiculous they can make it, the better, honestly. Like, I want to see how ridiculous they can get. So if I'm reading that they're going to have an animated series about Dominic Toretto's teen cousin, he's fighting a team called Shifter, you know, with an I replaced by a one and an E replaced by a three. Why not? You know, screw it. I want to see that. I want to see this series get as ridiculous as possible. Uh, those are just my thoughts, though. I don't know. I mean, maybe a lot of you are disappointed because you were hoping that at some point the Fast and the Furious would reboot itself into being something more serious. I don't know. But there you go. There's an animated Fast and the Furious spinoff coming. I don't think we have a release just yet. Oh, actually we do. It says it's supposed to start streaming on December 26th. So if you're excited, check it out. If not, don't really know what to tell you. I mean, it's a thing that's happening whether you like it or not. So <laughs> there you go. Alrighty, my final news story, it's an anime news story, and it's one that caught a lot of fans by surprise. Like honestly, if you look at the comments section for this story, a lot of people are saying the same thing. They're not disappointed, they're just really surprised. Uh, of course what I'm talking about, as the title of the article states, Megalobox Anime Gets Sequel. Uh, it's going to be called Megalobox 2. I mean, at least that's what we've known so far. And yeah, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, I think I did a review of it, but I don't remember if I was doing the podcast when it came out. April 2018. No, see, I think this was before I started the podcast. Because if I remember correctly, I started the podcast like September 2018. So I don't think I talked about this on the podcast ever. But there's this interesting show called Megalobox. And Megalobox, really awesome show. I would definitely recommend it. I would say go and look at my uh, review of it. But long story short, 
It's inspired by this other series called uh, Ashita no Jo. And Ashita no Jo is this manga having to do with boxing. And I guess for its 50th anniversary, they made Megalobox. And like I said, it's this series that's inspired by the manga. Uh, in it, we follow the story of this guy named Junk Dog. And basically, he works, uh, he takes dives. In boxing matches, that, that's his job. Him and his trainer, he takes dives like when they ask him to, and that's how he makes money. Uh, however, he's not happy with that life because he wants to be like an actual boxer. He wants to prove himself. He feels he has the skills. And in this world, one thing that I forgot to mention, uh, it's called Megalobox because basically all boxers are outfitted with these like mechanical arms that like enhance their skills. And basically at some point, you kind of have to watch how it happens. Uh, Junk Dog, he enters the Megalo Box tournament and he starts boxing against these other people with like their crazy mechanical arms. And his gimmick is that he does not use uh, any gear. Like he's just fighting natural. And he does it because he knows that he has to rise through the ranks really soon. And that's basically how he gets fights and that's how he gets attention. Because, you know, he's a guy with no mechanical arms in a world where this is standard boxing now. Like, that's, the, like, the latest tech. And you have to watch the show. It's just really good, though. I think the story is really well put together. The characters are interesting. The aesthetic is really interesting because even though it's a show that came out in 2018, it has this aesthetic that makes it look like a gritty, you know, anime from the 90s, which is, like, really cool. Uh, the music is phenomenal. They have, like, this really cool mix of, like, rap music and like rock music that sort of thing and yeah just the story of this underdog working his way up through the tournament fighting without the mechanical arms and stuff it's really interesting so uh as i was saying though a lot of people are surprised though because the first season is pretty conclusive it feels like it really tied everything up quite nicely so it having a second season is weird a lot of people aren't really sure what would happen or like how they're gonna do it but people are excited because, like I said, Megalo Box was a really good anime. A lot of people, it was like their favorite of that, you know, season in 2018, whatever season it was. I want to say it was like spring or whatever. So people are excited. People are looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, if you haven't watched Megalo Box season one, I definitely recommend it. I think this is a time to get caught up before season two, you know, eventually comes out. And yeah, if you have watched the show, there you go. Look forward to season two. How they'll do it, I don't know. But based on how good season one was, I think they know what they're doing. I have faith in them. There you go. Alrighty, guys. And that's it for the news week. That brings us to the end, you know, once again. Uh, hopefully there was something that you guys found to be informational, educational, informative, you know, entertaining, that sort of thing. Uh, I know it was a little bit short. I think we only covered like five news stories. Usually I cover like at least seven plus. But, you know, like I said, it just felt like it was a slow news week. So I just went with what I found was interesting but all the same hopefully you guys enjoy the news hopefully you guys got something out of it and yeah with that out of the way i think we should move on to the last section of the podcast which is of course the content creator spotlight uh my content creator for this week currently sitting at 115 subscribers i think they are a very you know like underrated channel i think they have some fun content and i think they definitely put their heart into everything that they do uh i am of course talking about a little channel called drawing for the fun of it and drawing for the fun of it as the name kind of implies they do a lot of drawing uh, the way they do it, though, not only do they have videos themselves where it shows them drawing, you know, like they have the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, speed drawing or whatever. But what's really cool is that even in videos where he's doing something else, he's still drawing in the background. Uh, like, for instance, you know, kind of reading some of the videos he's done recently, like top 10 films of the 2000s, top 10 films by year 1920 through 1929, top 10 Steven Spielberg directed films, uh, jumping down quite a bit, you know, he has one where he does a review of the Lone Wolf Cub, he talks about the Lone Wolf Cub, uh, going down a little farther than that, he has fun facts about Final Fantasy 13. uh, he has a video where he talks about, uh, different animated films, you know, top 20 animated films, 
films. Uh, I don't know. He just has all sorts of stuff where he's there talking about lists or he's like reviewing other YouTubers or he's just talking about things in general. Like, you know, he has a video where he talks about Disney and Lucasfilm and is it possible for the both of them to like please both fan bases? Like I said, he had the one where he's talking about facts about Final Fantasy 13, that sort of thing. So he has some really good lists. I think he... He always puts a lot of thought into them. And I think what's cool, like I said, that even like in a video, for instance, like the one where he's talking about uh, the top 10 films of the 2000s, as he's talking about them, yes, he has footage of the films he's talking about, but he's also doing the speed drawing. So I think that's what's, what makes him really cool. That he not only does like speed drawings themselves and like lists, but he finds a way to combine the both of them. So I think he's a talented artist. I think he seems like a really nice guy. I think his lists, like I said, they're always really insightful. Uh, I mean, he doesn't have too much videos. That will probably be like the only drawback. If you look, his oldest video, it says a year ago. So, I mean, you know, he hasn't been on YouTube for too long, but I enjoy his art. I enjoy his personality and his like voice. I think he's a really nice guy. I think he's a really insightful guy. And yeah, I mean, that's basically all I can really say. But yeah, drawing for the fun of it. I think if you guys want, you know, like some fun lists or you're looking for some fun footage of people speed drawing, I think this is your channel. I think he's worth checking out. Uh, likewise, you know, I know right now he, his latest video, he said a little update. And I know he is dealing with a lot of personal life stuff. You know, he is having some trouble. I think he was even thinking of taking a little break. But regardless, guys, you know, I think this is a time to really support him. I think the fact that he's going with, like, through some stuff, I think it would at least help him feel a little better. If you guys watched his stuff, commented, left likes, maybe even subscribed, you know, I think he definitely deserves it. And uh, drawing for the fun of it, if you're listening to this, I love your channel. I haven't been following it for too long, but I like your lists. I think, like I said, I think your lists are always insightful. I think your narration and like speaking voice is, I, I like it. You know, it's really good. I love how you integrate the speed drawing into like basically everything you do. I think that's really cool. I think you're a very talented artist. So, you know, applause there. And yeah, dude, I mean, I know your latest video, you were kind of talking about like some of your personal problems and stuff. So I would just say hang in there. Even though you only have 115 subscribers, I think anyone who's subscribed to you or anyone who even watches your stuff, I think they're all rooting for you. I think they all wish for the best. And likewise, you know, I hope that your channel grows. I definitely, you know, wish the best for you, dude. So, you know, there you go. And likewise, anyone else who's listening, give the guy a chance. Check out his channel. If you like his stuff, you know, like, comment, subscribe, that sort of thing. And if you check him out and if you give him some love, tell him that one of your reviewers sent you, you know, so... There you go. Alrighty, guys. And with that being said, that brings us to the end of another podcast. That is one more in the bag. Uh, kind of an awkward week. I mean, it definitely had its ups and downs. I had a fun week, but I also had like a lot of work I had to do. Uh, it's been a fun week with a lot of games such as Pokemon and Death Stranding, but it's also been quite a rough week with that Copa thing I was talking about at the beginning, you know? So, I mean, that definitely does leave me worried about the future of my channel, you know? But uh, all the same, hopefully you guys enjoy this podcast. Hopefully I talked about something that, you know, you guys found worthwhile, whether it was me introducing you to join it for the fun of it, whether it was one of the new stories I talked about, whether it was something that had to do with my week or whether it was me, you know, giving insight into Copa. Maybe you guys didn't know about it, but hopefully you guys enjoy this podcast. Hopefully there's something you guys thought made it worth listening to. And as always, you know, to wrap up, my name is Wannabe Reviewer, Wannabe Podcast, available on all sorts of platforms. Don't be shy, you know, go ahead and subscribe and download my podcast and share it with others, please. I'd really appreciate it. You can find me over on social media such as YouTube, Instagram, and Twitch. When it comes to those last two, I have neglected them a little bit, but hopefully with games like Pokemon, you know, Sword, hopefully I'll stream that at some point. I think that'd be really fun. And yeah, I will try my net my best to be back here next week for episode 57. I'm also going to try my best to have a review for Wednesday. It should be another game review. And then Monday, I'm going to have like a little unboxing, so to speak. So like that should be fun. But yeah, hopefully until next time, hopefully you guys have a wonderful week. My name is Imwanna Be Reviewer, and I will see you guys next time.